Um, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this DDEX webinar about how we manage writers, artists, engineers, and other contributors within uh, the DDEX standards. Uh, my name is Mark Isherwood, and I'm here with my colleague, Niels Rump, um, from the Secretariat. Um, I will be uh, giving you a brief overview of DDEX and also breaking down for you the types of parties that exist uh, and the way in which um, we name them. Um, and then Niels will explain how um, they appear uh, and are constructed within our standards, whether those be uh, in XML format or in flat file format. So that's our basic agenda um, for this webinar. As you know, um, uh, we're very open to questions, um, so please um, put your questions into the chat uh, and we will do our best to uh, answer those as we go along. Uh, and obviously there'll be a chance at the end to ask questions as well. As you know, um, DDEX is a standards development organisation and uh, the way in which uh, we do that is around three areas of activity. Um, probably the best known is the uh, creation of standard formats. So that's the order in which the data um, is, is to be uh, communicated and the relationships between different um, elements of the data. Uh, the second is choreography. So that's the order in which the messages have to be exchanged, uh, exchanged rather, and um, the definition of trigger points that might actually then require a message to be sent. And then finally, um, the uh, protocols by which the messages are, are actually exchanged. Uh, up until the last three, four, five years, uh, that has basically been using secure FTP sites. And so we define um, things like directory structures, file naming conventions, and, and things like that fairly straightforward. Um, but increasingly, uh, messages are being exchanged using web services um, and that allows a lot more automation of the exchange of information um, across the, the entire value chain. A quick look at um, all of the standards. This uh, map shows different types of organizations within the, um, uh, within the music value chain, starting right at the, at the left-hand side as you, as you look at it from with studios all the way to the right-hand side to DSPs um, and then everybody else in between. And you can see from that that um, we have now eight families of standards and um, these are all designed to cover particular types of business transactions between different types of uh, organizations that exist within the music industry value chain. Um, we aren't talking about any one of these specifically, but we're talking about um, how we manage parties, individuals and um, legal entities um, within the messages um, uh, as, as part of this webinar. Um, one thing I would like to point out um, is that in some ways, some people describe DDEX as a language. Um, and uh, that is very much down to our data dictionary. In, and the, way, the reason they call it a language is that uh, company A is translating their data model into DDEX, sending a message to company B, and company B is then translating the message back into their data models. And that enables them to talk to each other and know exactly what information is being communicated. So the data dictionary is really uh, our Tower of Babel and uh, very much the foundation of all of the work that we do at DDEX. It contains all of the semantics of all of the terms that appear in, in any of the standard messages, and it will contain the structure of, of common composites. So composites in our language are groups of data points that help describe a particular type of entity like a sound recording or a musical work. Um, and these composites get used multiple times throughout all of the messages 
uh, and provide a lot of common um, structure that can be reused regardless of which um, standard that you're, you're actually um, I implementing. DDIX is now pretty ubiquitous. Uh, over 5,500 implementation licenses have been issued, which would suggest uh, somewhere around that number have implemented um, the standards. Obviously, there will be companies that have fallen by the wayside um, within that group. Um, we, unfortunately, as the Secretariat, have very little information about what actual implementations are going on. Um, we obviously talk to our members, and so we know what people are imp implementing, but we don't have the specifics. But uh, as we sit now, there isn't really uh, a, a serious company operating in the uh, digital music space um, that doesn't use DDEX to some extent or another. So um, we're talking um, about parties um, and contributors uh, in this webinar. And so there's certain terminology that we uh, uh, need to uh, kind of break down. And we'll do that by looking at a particular example. So here is um, the... Um, this is obviously an old picture because it's actually uh, an, L, an, LB, an LP, so it's got a, um actual uh, cover art and um, uh, information on the back. And um, this is a way for us to, to show how we break down the different activities that um, people, um, part, uh, people uh, undertake within uh, the creation of a sound recording. So... Here we have a list of, of, of some of the uh, names and entities that appear on, on that cover art. Um, the first instance is Simon and Garfunkel, who we all know, of course. They are very much the brand of the album. Um, it's, it's under their name um, that the album is released um, um, and that the, the recording is published. In DDEX, we call these display artists. However, as we know, Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel are two of the um, people that make up Simon and Garfunkel. But in addition, there is um, somebody who uh, wrote the songs and produced the album, Dave, David Graham and Bob Johnson. Uh, and we call these individuals the contributors. Um, they contributed to the writing of the song, they contributed to singing the song, and so on and so on. Uh, not listed on the image uh, or on the slides are, of course, all the studio musicians who we also consider to be uh, contributors within uh, DDEX standards. And then finally, we come to uh, legal entities, companies, in this case, uh, the music publisher and the record company, we don't have a special term for these uh, types of parties, um, but they will all appear um, at different points in the, in the different standards. One last thing on this front, um, there are a number of different identification systems for parties. Um, many of these are proprietary to some degree or another. The one that isn't is ISNI, International Standard Name Identifier, which is an identifier for public personas. That isn't actually individuals or companies. So um, there is an ISNI for uh, Madonna as an artist. There's also an ISNI for um, uh, her, her writing name, which always seems to elude me. So the person, Madonna, has actually got two ISNIs to reflect her two different personas. IPN is the International um, Performer Number, um, which is obviously for, for performers and is used amongst the um, uh, collective rights organisations that collect royalties in respect for performers. It's not uh, publicly available. Um, Similarly, the International uh, uh, Party Identifier name number is for writers and publishers, uh, and this is um, run by the Musical Work um, uh, Collective Rights Organisations, and again is, is private to them, 
but very, very widely used. Both of the IPN and the IPI are very widely used in those particular uh, environments. Um, the, similarly, CSAC has a, a society number for the collection societies that are members of theirs. And of course, all companies have proprietary identifiers that they use uh, to identify entities within their own systems. And the final one is the DDEX party identifier, which is a very simple identifier and only intended to um, uh, express uh, or identify the ends of a, of a DDEX communication. So the sender and receiver of a DDEX message. So uh, those are the sections I want to talk to. I'm going to now hand the controls over to uh, Niels and he will uh, carry on um, with uh, the rest of the webinar. Over to you, Niels. Thank you very much, Mark. And may I remind everybody, if you have any question, please do feel free, just use the chat function. Uh, Mark will monitor that and will relay any questions that you may have to me. So let's talk about party identifiers, party descriptions, um, how we handle those things in DDEX messages. And to be fair, we have changed over time. In the older standards, um, the standards up until I would say two years ago, they um, like ERN3 and like the, the music, uh, um, the MLC standard, the standard for the communication with and amongst music licensing companies, which is now called Radar, um, Radar N specifically. We basically provided artists, parties as just strings. You could provide a party ID alongside, but most people in the most of the messages, especially ERN, just provided a string. So Queen would just be Queen, or Donna Summer would just be Donna Summer as uh, the, the, the singer. Um, if people then provided party identifiers, that was a bonus, but very often that did not happen. That means that the, the record companies were not enforcing a separation of separate parties with the same name. And those things do happen more often than you think. I just, for putting these slides together, I just had a quick look over the, on the internet. And there are hundreds of examples of the same artist name, display artist names we're talking here, as well as contributor names, where you have the same string, the same name representing two different, or more than that, um, uh, entities. So here are some, Donna Summer I mentioned, uh, mentioned. There's a di the disco singer, the one that I remember, um, but there is a break core musician. I have no idea what break core is, but anyway. Um, there is Genesis, which is um, the, the, the Phil Collins band, if you like, but there's also psychedelic rock band. There are multiple Jimmy Rogers, and there are even four bands called Ocean. Um, if you're in Poland, you would certainly want the Polish band, a uh, rock pop band. If you're in America, you're most likely interested in one of the other bands. Um, and depending on your preference of music, you may want to have the, 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 the metal band, or you may want to have the Christian music band. So it is quite important that we not only enable the communication of names, but to actually also make sure that when we communicate that information, that we pinpoint the precise person, band, grouping that we are referring to, or rather the precise public persona of the correct person, band, or whomever we're talking to and with. Um, so as I said, DDEX has changed over time because in the current version of ERN, as well as in the RIN file format, that's the format in which studio applications can collect information right at source before it actually enters the commercial value chain. The licensing standard like music work licensing, musical work notification, LOD standards, as well as a future version of Radar, they now provide parties in separate composites. 
you can still get away with just providing a name, but at least if you're communicating Donna Summer, say, and you communicate two different Donna, Donna Summers, even if you don't have an identifier, you would put them into different party composites and thereby clearly delineating and telling the recipient of the message, hey, these are two different parties that we're dealing with. If you provide an identifier, it clearly is much more powerful for the recipient who then can actually cross-reference the received information with information received from other parties. Um, but at least within that one message, you then have a clear delineation. Um, but there are other aspects that we need to separate out. One thing, or one thing that is actually quite complex to handle is, is the, the aspects of different languages and different territories. On the left-hand side, you see the image of um, a Russian composer. What's the right way of uh, um, writing his name? Is it the Russian way of writing it, the English way, or is it the German way? By the way, in Russian, you would um, always spell out the middle, his middle name. In English, you would most likely just put D, and in German, well, they don't care about middle names, so he would just be Dmitry uh, Shostakovich. Equally, what do you do with a band on the right-hand side? Here in the UK, they're typically called suede. In North America and in the US, they're mostly called the London suede. And that's what they're called in China. I have no idea whether that reads suede or the London suede or, or the European suede. I don't know. But we need to be able to communicate clearly different language and territorial uh, information for language reasons, because this is how you write that name in that person, but also for legal reason, because the London Suede is called the London Suede in the US because, well, there was another band called Suede already and they didn't want to get confused because of the issue that I just talked about. Um, and in another issue that um, we have actually re only recently finally come to terms with, by defining the rules, or we're in the process of defining those rules, how to handle that, and that's collaborations. Collaboration is becoming more and more common. Um, whenever I, um, you listen to the radio these days, pop radio these days, virtually everything is a um, collaboration, or, or very many tracks are collaborations. So how do you deal with those? Um, and given the, the distinctions between display artists and, and um, contributors that Mark mentioned earlier. Well, actually there is a further concept that Mark has not talked about and that's what we call a display artist name. So that's the single biggest name on the front of the album. So if we're going back to, um, to this slide, Coldplay versus the Swedish House Mafia, that would be the display artist name. And there are then two brands working together, Coldplay and the Swedish House Mafia. And then there are the, the, all the contributors um, that both of those bands, do you call Swedish House Mafia a band? Not sure. Um, but that both of those um, ensembles bring together. So you have a display artist, Coldplay, hopefully not just the string, but also an identifier. You have the Swedish House Mafia, hopefully not just the string, also with an ID. And then you have the display artist name, which would be Coldplay versus Swedish House Mafia without an ID. But what happens if suddenly this collaboration ceases to be a collaboration and becomes a, basically a band on its own, where you have um, just seven members that work together on a semi-permanent basis, um, but you really want to provide that with an identifier itself. Well, in that case, what you would be doing is actually creating a new display artist of Coldplay versus Swedish House Mafia with seven contributors. So in that case, you have a display artist, Coldplay versus Swedish House Mafia with an identifier, ideally. You have a display artist name, the same string, no identifier, 
and then you have all of these contributors. And it's these three bits of information, the display artist, the display artist name, and the list of contributors that, especially in the ERN message, are absolutely crucial to be communicated. Most other messages limit themselves to the display artist name and the contributors. So when you're talking about a licensing message, you need to know the big name in front on, on, on the front cover of your sound recording or album, and you need to know who is on that recording, who are the people that actually um, wrote the song and the, the companies that published the song so that you can then calculate the royalties and pay them. Equally, when we're talking about uh, the music licensing standards, the communication to the collection societies for performers and producers, you need to know the brand and the front of the product, the display artist name, and you need to know the contributors. In this case, it's the recording artists, the producers, the engineers, um, and you need to know um, the record company as well. Uh, Niels, there's a question come in about, are you talking here about um, ERN3, whether it's 3.7 or 3.8, or only in um, ERN4? We can just clarify that. Um, can we push, <laughs> we always say, uh, please ask the questions as soon as uh, you have them. Uh, can we wait with that question? I'll come back to that. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure I ha will have answered that before I come come to a close, but if not, we will address that later. In principle, I'm talking about both standards, um, but there are slight differences. So this is how it looks at ERN, ERN3 to be precise. Um, so this is a, a snippet from the XML schema definition for sound recordings. You have the artist brands, the display artist, and the display artist name in green with a green arrow there. You have the contributors in orange, and then you have the companies in blue. And for ERN, the crucial ones are the label name, um, and rights controller is then um, for the primarily for the publishing world. And as you can see, um, there's in green, the display artist and the display artist name. And it's naught to N in both cases in order to uh, satisfy requirements for multi-language and, and those kind of aspects. And then you have two resource contributor tags, one called resource contributor, one called indirect resource contributor. An indirect resource contributor is a bit of a problematic name um, because it was quite often misunderstood. What we meant by that was the resource contributor is actually who appears directly on the sound recording, the people in front of the microphone, the people behind the microphone. And the indirect resource contributors are those who contribute indirectly to the sound recording, that is, who actually produce the musical work that is then embedded in the sound recording. So that's where you would put your writers um, and potentially music publishers. So how do we describe a display artist in ERN3? At the top there, you have the, the, it looks like a very complex structure. You can either have a part ID or that's what the, the top yellow circle means. It's either a party ID, you can have one or many of those, or you can have a party name and potentially a party ID. What this structure gives you is the uh, insurance that you have at least a party ID or a name, but you can also have both. The party ID itself um, are the identifiers that that Mark has talked about. It can be proprietary ID, can be a, um, is, uh, a ISNI, can be an IPI, can be an IPN. Um, it very much depends on what type of person, what type of, of uh, public persona you want to speak about. If you use an IPI or an IPN, ISNI would work everywhere. Um, proprietary IDs work, would work everywhere. And uh, proprietary IDs are on the one hand problematic because 
only the company who allocates the identifiers knows the rules um, by which they are allocated and therefore by which two reference by to which parties are being told from one another are be separated. On the other hand, proprietary ID are also very, very powerful because they can be allocated whenever there is a need by somebody and they can then help to be used throughout the supply chain up until the point when there is an, in quote, official identifier such as an ISNI, for example. When it comes to the party name, um, DDEX is following here the, the, the guidance, if you like, from the text publishing industry, which uses a similar way to split names into multiple sub elements, if you like. You have a full name, so that would be in, in the Western world, first name, second first name, third first name, last name. Um, but in Asia, of course, the, 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 the family name and the, the given names are swapped around. But that doesn't matter for the full name. That's just the string the name usually appears. You then have the key name, which in the Western world is the last bit. In, in Asia, it's more the, the first bit of the name. And then you can have those elements that are either coming before or after the, the key name. Plus, we have the ability for an abbreviated name and even an ASCII transcribed name specifically to handle um, additional scripts or, or scripts going beyond Latin um, alphabet. The role here, do I talk about that? Yes, the role is a list of about two dozen fairly high level um, concepts such as it's a band or it's a it's a even bigger an, a, on, an ensemble, it's a featured artist. Um, those kind of things are being communicated here. And then you have uh, nationality here. When you're looking at the display artist composite in the MLC message, or as we now call it, radar message, you will have a much longer list of tags in there because they have an additional need to communicate about those artists. But the core, the identifier, the name, and the artist role, that's the same. It's just the tail end that differs greatly. And here, yeah, you have a nationality. Don't ask me why we included it back then. I don't remember. If we're looking for a contributor, I couldn't really fit the diagram onto the screen and still have it um, legible. Therefore, I've just listed the fields that you have. You have the same structure of name, party ID as before, and then you have a number of fields that are helpful or essential for the communication of that party. Their sex, their nationality, their date of birth or death. What's the primary role with respect to the sound recording or musical work that we're talking about? What's the instrument that they played? of course, only applies to the direct contributors, not the indirect contributors. Um, any other additional about the, the performance? Are they featured? Are they contracted? Are there any delegated usage rights that they have acquired or that they have contracts for that apply to the sound recording? And a whole raft more. All of those bits of information can be communicated. And in ERN3, if there is a person who is both a writer and a performer on the recording, so he's both, he wrote the song or she, as well as singing the, the, the song, you would need to include them as a direct contributor as well as an indirect contributor. And if they're the single artist, they are the brand, then you would need to include them also as a display artist and as a display artist name. So if, if you have a, a singer songwriter who, who plays all, all on its own, writes his own songs, shows up under his own brand name, under his no, own name, that name would need to appear four times in a descriptor of the sound recording. Sounds overkill, but as soon as you get to more complicated cases like Coldplay versus Swedish House Mafia, um, it starts to actually make sense to split it up that, that granular. 
And it's this granular piece of information that then enables um, DSPs to offer services for consumers where consumers can actually find the music that they want to listen to. So here is how the whole thing looks and um, you're in four. You have a display artist name, you have a display artist. Same two things, they just appear in a more logical order, I would, I would suggest. Um, and then you have one contributor composite rather than multiple ones. So it makes it actually much simpler. Writers and performers on a sound recording, they're now in one composite. So Paul Simon, in when he had his own, when he was working on his own, um, he would now just be a writer as well as a recording artist within the same contributor composite. What year and four also allows you is actually to provide character information in the sense of radio plays and, and theater plays and those kind of things where you can say, well, he played a specific character in a play or she played the character in a play um, as to just the artist being mentioned, but also the role being mentioned and identified and all the same, same thing. So in the end, the fictional role, the fictional party is treated pretty much the same way as the a physical party that actually plays that um, fictional character. Also different is that now each of the individual tags have territory and language attributes. In ERN3, it was all in a um, sound recording details by territory composite or release details by territory. Um, it was all, all wrapped in, in one big composite, not very elegant, in year and four, we have uh, made it much simpler, much much more straightforward. This is how the display artist looks in year and four, and it's somewhat different in that we now have no longer a name and an identifier in the display artist composite like we had in year and three, because as I said at the beginning we now have a separate list of all the parties in one place where this artist party reference just points to. You then have the display artist role. That's basically to differentiate whether somebody's featured or non-featured. And then you have the artistic role. That's what we call, well, that was the artist role in year in three. But also interesting is title display information. How does a name of a display artist, how should that be shown in the title? Especially in classical music, you quite often have a display artist as part of the album title. It's less so in, in popular music, but a conductor or an orchestra in, in classical music is quite often part of the title of the album. Therefore, we need to have the ability to communicate that kind of information. And the contributor, again, much simpler than in ERN3, I would think. You again have the same pointer to the party composite at the top. Here it's called contributor party reference. Then you have the role and the instrument that they played. Whether that contribution that they've made to that sound recording is featured or contracted, whether they should be credited, and then how the credits should be shown if not just their name. Now the instrument and roll types, that's now hundreds of values uh, um, from, I don't know, fifth trombone to all the different voices and, and those kind of things. So there's a very, very long list that we have now um, provided as, as, as values there. Um, that list is not comprehensive and it will never be comprehensive, let's be honest. But what you can do is you can always provide a user defined value if none of the values that the standard defines are present. Um, but we will continue to, to update that list. So if something isn't in the list today, then yeah, in all likelihood, it will be added in, in there tomorrow if there's a need for it. So I talked about this separate party list. 
this is how ERN4, the, the, the very top level of ERN4 looks like. Message header, release admin isn't, isn't uh, of, of interest at the moment. Then you have the party list and underneath there, you then have all the, the different things that describe the stuff that those parties worked on. Queue sheets, the resources, the, the, the chapters specifically for uh, radio plays, releases, and then the deals under which something is available. And the party looks like this. And the core you see looks very much like what we had in ERN3 because that worked well. You have the party ID and the party name, um, or you have at least one of those two things. And then you can provide additional information that is relevant for the specific business transaction. In this case, it's an affiliation, a related party, and an artist profile page. Specifically, the related party, which enables you now to say, well, actually, here we have the Beatles. That's the display artist. What are the related parties? Well, there are four members of the Beatles, aren't there? So you can now include their, them in the ERN and link them as well, giving now the DSP much more information about um, how these different parties, especially when it comes to bands and, and ensembles, how they actually interrelate. And there's some quite interesting development on that, and I'll talk about that at the very end. Niels, before you go on, there's a, there's another question, uh, and perhaps whilst we deal with that, could Ziggy indicate whether he feels we've answered his question about three seven three eight and four? Um, the other question is: Is it possible to communicate aliases and name variations as Discogs does? Mm. I'll defer that again, if I may, to the very end uh, of this presentation, um, because at the moment, the DDEX standards cannot really do that, but we're working on something that will be able to, to, to handle exactly that, because that is indeed an issue. Okay, and Ziggy's happy, so uh, move on, thank you. Excellent. DDEX though has not just developed XML standards, though that's where we started and most of our standards are XML standards. We've chosen XML because it's very suited to hierarchical information and let's be honest, a musical product is a fairly hierarchical thing. You have the album, you, underneath that you have multiple sound recordings, underneath that you have multiple, um, excuse me, um, you have multiple musical works. Um, and on all levels, you have parties. So that's a really hierarchical structure. There are some business transactions, however, where hierarchies are not really essential. And that is specifically in the sense of, or in the purpose of sales and usage reporting, reporting of usages. In that case, a flat file structure is actually sufficient. So we have multiple standards in that realm. There's the DSR standard, digital sales reporting standard. There is the claim and detail message standard, which is the, if you like, response to the DSR standard. And there is the radar reporting standard, which is basically a DSR for music licensing companies. Um, all of those are flat file structures, but they still need to be able to communicate parties. So those standards, as I said, are flat file, tabular data, basically, and we use tabulated separated uh, value files. But because we have now individual cells, we need to spread, if you like, people, parties over multiple cells, over two cells, in fact. Typically, Parties with different roles are then in different cell pairs. So um, one of the things in the DSR standard is, for example, when describing a musical work, well, you have writers, you have arrangers, you have publishers, and you have parties where you don't know which of the other bits they are. So you there have four different um, party name, party ID, 
cell pairs to basically communicate um, all of those different roles. How do we do that? Well, this is how we do it uh, formally. So you have, a, for example, a display artist name for a product or a sound recording, and then a display artist party ID of that, that, of that display artist name. The problem that you're facing is, though, that other than in DSR, uh, sorry, in XML, what you do if you have multiple parties? Well, that's easily done because the DSR, CDM, and radar standards, they all support a so-called secondary delimiter. So within each of those fields, other than display artist name, but if you're going to writer, for example, you do have the ability to put two writers in there. So you have John Lennon, Pipe, that's the second character, the secondary delimiter, Paul McCartney in one cell. And then the next cell, you would then have identifier for Paul, for John Lennon, Pipe, identifier for Paul McCartney. And the standard in that case says that you have to have exactly the same sub cells in, in, in the name and in the identifier field. But this then comes to another limitation. At the moment, that means you can only have one identifier for each party. And we're currently working on a solution to change that. I think we've, we've found it. Um, but we're in the process of, of uh, approving that. It has to do with escaping um, those, uh, those pipe characters. But um, since it's not fully approved, I'm, I better not um, spill the beans as of yet. So this is how it would look like. John Lennon, and then you have a party ID, or John Lemon, pipe, Paul McCartney, and then you have their two ISNIs. Uh, Please note in this table here for the for the slides, I put a space around between John Lennon, space pipe, space Paul McCartney. That's technically wrong. Um, it's just for readability here. Otherwise, you can't differentiate between uh, the pipe character and the capital letter, letter I. So I just, um, yeah, decided to show it like this. So do not include them in, in, in actual messages. But as I said, we're working on, on a solution to overcome this weakness. You've asked about how do we deal with additional richer information about parties, about synonyms, about pronunciation. How does my, my voice agent know how to pronounce Shostakovich? or Coldplay for that matter. If that device is set, set to English, well, they will be able to deal with Coldplay. But if my language isn't um, English, that device still, and my device isn't set to being English, it should still render this string C-O-L-D-P-L-A-Y to Coldplay or something similar, both understanding me saying it as well as speaking it back to me. And that's where a new standard, it doesn't exist yet, we are in the well-advanced way of um, developing it, comes into play. So it's a standard message to communicate details about parties, such as names, and, and very much important is the S at the end. It's plural. Different names for different territories, for different um, languages, but also different types of names. Eric Clapton, slow hand. That's a nickname for him. That can be communicated there. All of those different um, aspects of links between parties, whether that's a link between Madonna's recording persona and Madonna's writing per um, persona that Mark mentioned at the beginning, those links between parties can all be communicated with this new standard. 
So the relationships between parties and party names to other parties, as well as um, creations such as what they wrote, what they recorded, um, what they showed up on, what they were influenced by, what they have influenced, all of those bits and pieces um, are being looked at at the moment. But it's also other things. What awards do they have? What charts do they have? And so uh, chart successes they had. A lot of the information actually comes from an already published standard, Mead. We have kind of decided to split Mead in two. One standard specifically to deal with parties. And then Mead will focus on the stuff itself. There's clearly some overlap, but that's kind of the, the separation that we're working on. So what Mead currently contains about parties will be taken out of Mead and put into the new party standard. I don't know how it's going to be called. And, and the rest will remain in, in Mead. So as I said, we are working on it. I would expect that to happen in 2021. But who knows with the pandemic, we're still working and next week we have a plenary where this will be discussed. But all, but the pandemic that we're all working under does uh, change things somewhat. But I still expect this standard to be published at some stage in 2021. Maybe I should add, uh, add one other uh, um, thing here. Critical for Mead, as well as this new party standard, is that it differs critically for from ERN in that it is it can be connected to an ERN, but it can also be completely set on its own. So a record company will be able to send an ERN and accompany that with a Mead message to talk about this stuff that's in the ERN message, and they will be able to accompany that with a party message to talk about the the, the name variation, aliases, and so forth. And package that together and send that off to DSPs. But you can also have Discogs, for example, you mentioned Discogs, offer a service where the data that they have, they can offer to, to DSPs um, so that DSPs can, can basically harvest the, the richness of the information that Discogs or Music Brains or Jaxta um or or grace note all of those services all the rich information that they have they can do that with mead and they can do that with with a forthcoming party standard um so that's where we're going we know erN can't do that and is not supposed to be doing that because erN is core information aliases name variations is is richer information important but not core. Cool. I hope that helps. Are there any questions um, anyone has on, on what we've presented? I think we've picked up on the questions so far. Okay well in that case uh, thank you all very much for attending the webinar. I hope you found it helpful. There are uh, two or three more coming along um, towards uh, the end of this month. Um, and uh, in December. Thanks very much indeed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.